All right, everybody, let's get started. Hello, good afternoon, and welcome to the Lunchtime Discovery Series. It is good to be with you again for another edition of our program. We took a break last week, so, uh, you know, I missed you. I missed not having my Lunchtime Discovery friends and fans, but I'm glad that we're back here gathered around the glow of our YouTube screens, ready to meet interesting people and learn interesting things out there in the world of science engineering, technology, math, art, education, nature, conservation, and more. We do it all here at the Lunchtime Discovery Series. All stuff that I think people who are paying attention to what happens at the Museum of Natural Sciences here in Raleigh or the Office of Environmental Education. If you're familiar with what's going on with those two places, then we've got the program for you here at the museum's YouTube channel. Uh, if you've not been here in a while or if this is your first time, welcome. My name is Chris Smith. I'm the coordinator for Current Science Programs here at the Museum of Natural Sciences. And this program is brought to you by the folks with the Office of Environmental Education, a part of the NC Department of Environmental Quality, working together to bring you a fantastic program most Wednesdays at noon. Today, we have a fantastic guest for you. So strap in. I think we're going to be going for quite the ride today. Uh, as uh, the Office of Environmental Education folks, as Marty was putting in the chat, like, We've already been having some like interesting discussion around today's topic before we brought it here live, like before we flipped the switch and came over here. Uh, so I think today's going to be a good one. In fact, I know today's going to be a good one because today's guest uh, works for one of the just best institutions out there, like one of the best places, has one of the coolest jobs. It's Dr. Bronwyn Williams, who, guess where she works, here at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences with us as the research curator for non-molluscan invertebrates. And Bronwyn joins me now. Hi, Bronwyn. Hi, Chris. Good to see you again. Likewise. Uh, I'm excited for this talk. Um, for more than just, I initially, we talked about this, I saw the title and I was like, aquatic nuisance species and blue crab. That doesn't make any sense. We've had, we have blue crab in North Carolina. It's a fishery I don't understand. But that's not what we're talking about today. Correct. I, I had to correct myself. You had to correct me. But, you know, just a little sleight of hand with the wording. So it's all good. So I'm excited to learn more about this blue land crab uh, and what's going on. I'll turn the program over to you. Excellent. Thank you. All right. Let's get this all going. Okay, excellent. Move this over. All right. So on a Friday morning in mid-July, I received a phone call from Rachel Hoke, who's the assistant directory of uh, director. Excuse me, the assistant chief of fisheries, aquatic wildlife diversity, in the Inland Fisheries Division of the North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission. So she told me that the Wildlife Resources Commission had received a report of a blue land crab on Emerald Isle and asked if this is something. A, that I could identify, B, something we should be worried about, and C, something that I was interested in. It's sort of broad, but you know, I can say my familiarity with blue land crabs is pretty minimal. However, you know, as research curator of non molluscan invertebrates, I did know that we had several blue land crab specimens in the collection, and just sort of oddly enough, I had actually just rehoused a few of those those specimen lots recently. So I asked Rachel, did the report include photos? As I thought it wouldn't be that difficult to confirm the ID. I mean, it's a blue land crab. It's kind of what its name is. It's blue, it's a land crab. And get this to go. There we go. Yes, there were photos. And it's not just a blue land crab, it's a big blue land crab. But I'm gonna stomp on the proverbial brakes right here because I wanna give you some background information before we talk about what happened next with this crab specimen. So bear with me. Okay, for, for those of you who are taxonomically curious, the blue land crab is a grapsoid crab in the family G. carcinidae, which is a group of true crabs that are adapted for terrestrial life throughout much of their life history. 
So the blue land crab is one of four extant or living species in the genus Cardosoma. So we've got Cardosoma armatum as we work from on the right hand side of your screen from the top down. So Cardosoma armatum is the rainbow crab, moon crab, or as it's known in the pet trade, the soap dish crab. That's an interesting story in amongst itself. The middle Cardosoma species um, is Carnifex, the brown lab, brown La land crab, aptly named, or red claw crab. And this occurs in the Indo-Pacific region. So I guess I didn't say that rainbow crab, that first one is known from uh, the Eastern Atlantic along the west coast of Africa. So the third or fourth, if we're counting the blue uh, blue land crab species of Cardosoma is on that lower right-hand side, Cardosoma chrysum, which is the mouthless crab, which occurs in areas of tro the tropical Eastern Pacific. But what about the blue land crab? All right, well, it was described from specimens that were collected in Brazil. So the native distribution of the blue land crab spans a good portion of the tropical Western Atlantic. So along much of the coast of Brazil, northwards through Central America, throughout the Caribbean, Bermuda, and along portions of the Northern Gulf Coast into Southern Florida. But our understanding of the Northern extent of the native distribution of the blue land crab in the US is just a little bit problematic. So there are several blue land crab specimens in the Smithsonian's National Museum of Natural History from the Miami area, Florida, that range in dates, collection dates from 1901 to 1916. But in 1962, Charles Gifford of the Institute of Marine Science at the University of Miami reported that he had either seen personally or had received what he called, you know, reports from competent observers of blue land crabs from Bureau Beach, which is north of Miami on the, the Atlantic, sort of the ocean side, all the way down around the tip of Florida and uh, the Florida Peninsula, up the Gulf Coast, uh, uh, excuse me, up the Gulf Coast to Tampa. He also had verified reports, what he considered verifiable reports from Louisiana and Southern Texas. So this is kind of that time stance of, yeah. Excuse me. I think I am over caffeinated. We were talking, we were joking about this before. Um, so this is the timestamp of sorts. This 1962 report that really has established our presumption of the native distribution of blue land, land crabs. So whether that's true or not, we don't know. But this is kind of that that line which which we use for everything that is to come in the future. Okay. In late September 1997. A single blue land crab was caught in South Carolina near the Charleston Crab House restaurant at Wapu Bridge. And certainly get into the chat if you've been to that restaurant. You probably know exactly you were looking at the site where this thing was caught. So the Wapu Bridge connects the city of Charleston with James Island. So now the specimen was given to the South Carolina Department of Natural Resources. It was identified and it was deposited um, at the Southeast Regional Taxonomic Center Collection, or CERTSI. Now, the Surtsey Collection, which was housed at the South Carolina DNR Marine Resources Center at Fort Johnson, up until just a couple of years ago when it was actually transferred to us. So the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences now houses the Surtsey Collection, which is important for many, many reasons. But the crab that's in this photo, even though it is part of the Surtsey Collection, isn't actually the one caught in 1997. This is, and I'm holding it in my hand again to show you that here's the actual physical specimen, the very first specimen that was reported from South Carolina. Kind of, again, we're going from 1962, was known as far north as Bureau Beach, Florida. And now it's jumping all the way up to Charleston. Okay. So while this photo that I've been showing you is, is not of that first blue land crab that was reported to South Carolina DNR in 1997, it is the blue land crab in the Surtsey collection as some of my favorite specimen notes attached to it. Okay, on August 27, 2004, Ken Smith, who's the donor and the collector, was presumably working late or maybe the night shift at 7 p.m. in a warehouse 
on the old Charleston Naval Base. He, quote unquote, found the crab scratching his office door. So I'm trying to picture this scenario. It seems like a perfect setting for a B-movie that I would just watch over and over again. Tack of the Blue Land Crab, right? Was Ken's office door closed? I mean, I'm assuming so if he heard it scratching on it. So what did he think when he heard scratching at the door? What sort of scratching? How loud was that scratching? He's just sitting there working away. 7 p.m., nobody else is around. And then when, when you open up that door and you don't see anybody, I mean, what what's your thought? You look down and there's this giant crab there what, what what was ken's reaction i mean i'll admit i'd be pretty startled to see a large land crab you know standing outside of my door when i thought that i was all alone but wait it gets better when ken reported the crab to the south carolina dnr he identified it as a fiddler crab on steroids and this was written into the notes that will be basically thus forever. And I can definitely see that blue land crabs do look like giant fiddler crabs. So here is that crab, right? Here's the fiddler crab on steroids. Now it's not our largest blue land, land crab specimen, but it's, it's still pretty startlingly large. Okay, coming back to the more general scenario. So there were only a handful of records that of blue land crabs in Charleston, ranging from 1997 all the way up to 2021. I actually think there were only about 12 of them, if I recall correctly. And of those, five of five vouchers were taken and added to the CERTSI database and are now residing here um, in Raleigh with the North Carolina Museum of Natural mm -hmm. Sciences. So the scarcity of records of this species in South Carolina really suggested that, this, that it, albeit having been introduced at least once, to the Charleston area didn't seem to have become established. So maybe it was hitching rides in on, you know, I don't know, boats that were coming up from Florida, um, you know, and and moored in, in Charleston Harbor. I don't know. But in late summer 2022, there was a noticeable uptick in the number of unsolicited reports of blue land crabs that were submitted to the South Carolina DNR. And so as a result, researchers with the South Carolina DNR established an online reporting system for the public to submit information about blue land crab sightings. And the development of this reporting form was accompanied by kind of a huge public service announcement style approach that involved basically pushing information through multiple news outlets and social and through social media. So the push for public engagement worked. The South Carolina DNR received numerous reports in a fairly short period of time. So it was really impressive work. And this is where I have to say, you know, huge kudos to my colleagues with the South Carolina DNR for doing this and for basically, you know, I mean, essentially establishing this kind of community science approach to understanding what the spread um, to the distribution of this species was. Now, this certainly is not my work to flaunt. I'll let them do that. But for the purposes of this talk, one of the most important pieces of information that we gleaned from these reports was the discovery of the blue land crab in Myrtle Beach, which is just south of the North Carolina border. So we get to the end of the reporting period, at least the formal reporting period that was analyzed by the South Carolina DNR. That takes us to December 2022. So this is the point where I now want to circle back around where I started this talk with that phone call from Rachel Hoke in mid-July 2023. And the three images that the landowner who submitted that report sent to the North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission. So this is the crab that was on Emerald Isle. And now I have to have a little, little kind of side note in here that at the time, I was completely unaware of all of the, the work that the South Carolina DNR had been doing with respect to the blue land crab over the last year. I'm not sure why I didn't know. I didn't know. So basically, you know, I didn't even know about the Myrtle Beach uh, record at that point. All I knew was from our collection that blue land crabs had been found in the Charleston area of South Carolina. Beyond that, just think blank slate. Okay, 
where's Emerald Isle? Now, I know some of you may be familiar with this area of North Carolina, but for context for everybody else, we're talking about here in this green box, kind of in coastal Carteret County. Myrtle Beach, I've kind of pointed out with that arrow down at the very bottom. So again, we're looking at a big jump in if if indeed this is sort of that distribution of the crab. This looks like this is a pretty significant range extension. And here's sort of a, a zoomed in, in portion of that map. So Emerald Isle is on the western edge of the island of Bogue Banks. So the sighting is an important one because it was the first confirmed report of a blue land crab in North Carolina. We had so many questions for the landowner. You know, really all I had was that ominous phone call from Rachel Hope saying, we have this blue land crab on Emerald Isle. Here are some photos. What do you think? I'm generalizing, of course, but... We're also interested in capturing this crab really kind of as a physical voucher to deposit in the museum collection, kind of a means to sort of have physical documentation that this species is in the state. So if you're wondering why physical vouchers are important or why we're actually interested in, again, kind of getting this into the museum collection, if I don't get to this later in the talk, please ask in the chat. So North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission biologist Nick Shaver was tasked with being the temporary state blue land crab expert. And he was the one that coordinated the time for, for us to come on this landowner's property. So I think this was about four or five days after the report was submitted. Megan McCuller, who's collections manager of non-molested invertebrates here at the museum, Nick Shaver and I all converged on this landowner's property. Just down in Emerald Isle, some known unknown place on, on, on sort of Ocean Drive. So this is not the exact location of the blue crab sighting, but I, I wanted to show you because it illustrates the habitat that we were dealing with. So the area is built up, as you might expect, kind of along, you know, as it is along most parts of the coastal of coastal North America, uh, North Carolina. But you have small pockets of maritime forest. So the houses on the right are directly on the beach for context. OK, the landowner was absolutely phenomenal. So she showed us ring camera, ring camera footage of the blue land crab in their driveway. And I'll, I'll admit it was pretty humorous. I don't have it to show here, but I'll sort of try to try to describe it. So the crab itself didn't actually set off the ring camera. It was a homeowner's dog that saw the crab in the driveway, started barking, alerted um, kind of the occupants of that house that there was something outside. They go and they look and opening the door, that's what I think kind of, you know, initiated the, the ring camera video footage. So it's funny because the video starts with just the crab appearing out of nowhere in the middle of the driveway. Sort of several people coming out the door uh, with a lot of really amazing language, you know, about this giant crab that's that's in their driveway. The crab then scuttles over under the car. So it's not a small crab. This thing was probably the size of a volleyball. Maybe maybe a little bit smaller, but you know, it's it pretty big. So this is a tire of a pretty good size SUV, if that kind of helps put this in, in perspective. Okay. So I was under the naive assumption that there would be an obvious burrow near where the crab had been sighted. Okay, I work with crayfish. Burrowing crayfish are a pain in the butt to get, but oftentimes we find their, them near or in, near chimneys or kind of in their burrows. Chimneys are kind of that 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 cue for us. But of course, silly me. So Nick, Megan, and I searched the landowner's front yard, which was very well manicured, and and what have you, side yards, backyards, and even all the yards of of you know, neighboring properties for what seemed eons, and I'm sure it was only maybe an hour, I don't know, um, before coming to the realization that we were not going to find this burrow or the crab without help. So I need to stop here and thank the landowner and her neighbors for allowing us on their property. I mean, that was just, that was huge. Um, even though 
we didn't allocate the crab. I think this was this was just really a wonderful um, opportunity. And I've got this video here. If I can start this to show. Sorry, I've got laptop in front of the uh, where the screen is. You'll see me sort of. All right. So this is kind of that remnant maritime forest in the backyard that we were basically rooting through, trying to kind of you know, look under the leaves and, you know, looking for anything that looked like a potential burrow. And really, we didn't want to go digging in any random hole either. I mean, that would be pretty destructive. And, you know, we we wanted to confirm, have confirmation that, that there was actually a land crab kind of in sight. Okay. So the visit to this property was, even though we came up short, it was really wonderful. We had still had so many questions that now went beyond that landowner, right? So was this just a solo blue land crab that had hitchhiked to Emerald Isle? Where did it come from? Did it sort of hitch a ride on a, you know, boat trailer from Myrtle Beach? Or did it come from elsewhere along, you know, sort of the southeastern coast? Was it an escaped pet? Well, how do we find out any of this information? Well, one thing we could do is actually get the word out in Emerald Isle to have people looking out for this crab, right? So if we we could get the word out there, get people to report sightings, if those sightings are in a localized area and they're all of a crab of kind of the same size and shape, you know, maybe it is just a solo crab that hitched a ride, running around Emerald Isle, is going to live out, you know, its days, loving it, eating vegetation and blueberries, as we found out they like. Um, you know, basically till, till it is no more. And if it's a male, great. Okay. If it's a female, well, that might be a little bit of a different story, not to sound all Handmaid's Tale here. But if that female is gravid, that could lead to, you know, even just a, a single individual in an area could lead to some problems. The landowner suggested that we stop by the Emerald Isle town office to ask if they would be willing to help us spread the word. And so that's exactly what we did. The three of us, sweaty, dirty, a little bit tired, and crabless, sadly, went to the town administrative offices, Emerald Isle. And I am sure we thoroughly confused the woman who was at the front desk trying to explain what we wanted, you know, trying to think about. Okay, this land crab not supposed to be here. Want to, you know, tem can Emerald Isle help us get sightings? I don't know. It's it's great. Anyway, we talked to a couple people and ended up chatting with Mark Cruz, who's the town public information office. And Mark was amazing. And I could tell you things happened really fast at that point. So really, I think all we were looking for was, can we push some information out, let's say through social media, through the town newsletter to just say, hey, have you seen me? Grab pictures, you know, whatever. Well, Mark had other ideas, which were great. And he said, which one of you wants to be on video for a public service announcement that, you know, that we'll push? And of course, I think both Megan and and Nick were just kind of like, yeah, not it. Um I'm making this seem like I, I didn't want the limelight. But anyway, last, next thing I know, I'm in front of the camera, basically trying to, you know, babbling about blue land crabs, um, which then, you know, Mark just turned around rapid quick um, as a minute and a half um, public service announcement. Um, and despite my babbling, Mark did an amazing job putting this together and and pushing it out. And it ended up kind of on, so there are social media and other online resources. So I'm going to attempt now to play this PSA for you. I'm Dr. Bronwyn Williams, research curator of invertebrates at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. So it's been brought to our attention that really unique species to this area a uh, blue land crab has been spotted on Emerald Isle. It's a really interesting find because it's never been reported from North Carolina before. And so we need your help to learn more about where it is, try to locate it, 
figure out kind of how extensive at all this population is on Emerald Isle. So if you see this crab, what you're looking for is a fairly large crab. It's typically bluish tinted. It's about the size of a coconut. Think about that. It's been described by some as fiddler crab on steroids. It looks like a cross between a ghost crab and a fiddler crab. You're not gonna find it on the beach proper. It is a true land crab, so it's gonna be up in the maritime forest areas or in people's yards. But if you do spot this, would really appreciate it if you know, if you can get a photo, that's great. If not, if you can just identify it and contact us with the photos or without using the information that we've provided here. Thank you all for your help uh, with this. Again, nothing to be alarmed about. We just appreciate kind of your assistance in allowing us to learn more about this unique species to this area and this unique opportunity. Thanks again. Ah, okay, you don't need Brahman. to hear that again. All right, anyway, as usual, pretty awkward in front of the camera, but it was fun. Mark did an amazing job. And most importantly, it worked. So we got the word out there. Maybe it didn't get spread widely, but about a week and a half after this PSA went out, Nick Shaver received another report from a landowner in Broad Creek, which is on the mainland side of Bogue Sound. So across from Emerald Isle. And according to the landowner, the crab came up and actually got into a bowl of water sitting by their garage while her partner was grilling. So this is a picture of that blue land crab after it had crawled into this bowl of water and was just sitting there. So again, they're not right on the water. They're about 800 and 900 feet, according to the landowner, from the intracoastal waterway and about 150 feet from a canal. So that kind of jives for what we know about this blue land crab. And she said it was between four and five inches wide. So again, a pretty, pretty sizable blue land crab. Well, that same day, and so this is August 7th, so all this is happening within about a two week period here, another report was submitted. This one via the museum's Ask a Naturalist portal. So the sighting wasn't contemporary, con was not contemporary with the report. The landowner had seen and snapped this picture on July 21st, the very same day I got the call from Rachel Hoke about that initial Emerald Isle sighting. So this report is interesting for a few reasons, not least of which, this is a juvenile. So this is her deck, right? So this is coming out of the, the, the deck slats. This is a pretty tiny little blue land crab. And the juvenile suggests that Maybe we have a breeding population in the Bogues Sound area. Now, this isn't certain. We haven't seen an egg-bearing female. But it's kind of interesting, right? Okay. So before I kind of move on a little bit about this, this got really funny, at least for me. And again, you know, hopefully I'm not playing the telephone game too much. And if any of the landowners that submitted these reports sees this, please, you know, correct the record uh, if and as needed. But because both of these sightings came in on the same day, and I passed this information along to Rachel Hoke and to the other folks that were in our network um, that kind of monitoring the um, non-Indigenous species, uh, aquatic species, that included DEQ folks, DMF folks, Rachel reached out to basically law enforcement, so Wildlife Resources Commission law enforcement, and asked if a conservation officer would actually be willing to stop in and chat with each of these landowners and see if it would be possible to actually obtain these crabs. Again, we're really looking for vouchers at this point to put in the museum. And again, I'll come back to this. So here's where it's second or third hand from me. But I think he started, this conservation officer started with the Broad Creek um, report. And when he explained what he was looking for and why he was actually looking to catch the physical crab, that, that this crab would then be, you know, again, sent to the, the Museum of Natural Sciences. It's my understanding that the landowner basically ran into her garage, grabbed a rake and a shovel, handed him one, said, let's get digging. So, you know, sort of excitement to, to, to have, you know, that crab be the one that is kind of, that establishes the presence 
you know, as a physical voucher at the museum. And the landowner um, sort of in, you know, in the Indian beach, on the Indian beach side was also sort of very, very wonderful. And, you know, we've had conversations over email back and forth, and we think that we may have actually found uh, burrows sort of on that landowner's property. So there's some potential here to kind of move forward and, you know, gain an understanding of, of, of what's what's going on. Okay, so what do we know now? Well, we can definitely say that that first blue crab from Emerald Isle was not a solo hitchhiker, all right? Well, we may, we sort of stretch our thinking a little bit. We may have had three separate hitchhiking events by each of these three separate crabs that have been reported, maybe. But it appears that, again, based on that juvenile and sort of the spread of you know, even these handful of sites throughout around Bogue Sound, it appears that we might have an established, albeit still very small population of blue land crabs in the Bogue Sound area. All right, how will we find out for sure? Well, this is where the power of community comes into play, right? We need your help. So those of you who live on the coast or travel to the coast or have friends or family that do, spread the word. Please keep an eye out for blue land crabs in coastal North Carolina and not just Carteret County. We don't know where these things are or might spread to. So if you think you see one, please report it. Photos are wonderful. I mean, even I think at this point, seeing what blue lab, blue land crabs look like, you know, blurry Bigfoot photos of blue land crabs are better than nothing at this point. So if you get anywhere close to them, take photos, submit those, they help us confirm the identification. All right, how do you report these sightings? Well, there are a few different ways that you can do so. So the South Carolina DNR has been a fantastic collaborator with this situation, right? If you recall, they had already established this reporting form to track reports of blue land crabs in South Carolina. So we worked with them to modify kind of that reporting form to accommodate sightings in North Carolina. So why should we reinvent the wheel when it's all kind of that same sort of situation of the spread of this non-native crab species? And here's what the form looks like. So it was developed using ArcGIS Survey123, so it can be accessed via the Survey123 field app or online. And once again, excuse me while I move my computer out of the way, I want to show you as I scroll down. So here's the first page of the reporting or their, their report. So it'll kind of help guide you to identifying what these look like, what you're looking for with active burrows. And when you switch to the next page, this is where you're going to put your information, okay, the date of observation, where it was, any other information that you can provide, you know, an uploading any any images possible this would be great. So even though this is taking you through to a South Carolina Department of Natural Resources website, we're actually gaining this information kind of back in return. So it's kind of one big collaboration across the Carolinas. Okay, another way to report blue land crab sightings is via the Ask a Naturalist form on the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences website. So we got one of those amazing, that juvenile um, blue land crab sighting came through this portal. And we've received some phenomenal sightings of all sorts of organisms and not organisms as well, kind of through the Ask a Naturalist portal, not just, not just blue land crabs. Now, a third way to report blue land crab sightings is by emailing me directly, of course. So, um, and you can, you can either sort of throw that in the chat or, you know, go on the museum's website and and uh, and hunt me down. Okay, so what happens to all this information once it's submitted? Okay, what sort of it doesn't go into this black box, I don't think. Okay, the first step is confirmation of identification. So if you've got images and they're great images, it's kind of a no brainer to identify blue land crabs for us. So we can kind of acknowledge, yep, that's what it is. That's great. If the images aren't great, or if you don't have images, that may be a conversation, you know, if you're that 
if you're willing to have it, we certainly are kind of this back and forth and or, you know, I'm happy to make a site visit if it's something that we want to kind of try to track these things down. But once we've confirmed the identification, we sort of strip all that personal information off of it and we share the locality, this sort of this information with all of our partners. We have a network of collaborators that are across multiple agencies in North Carolina and then also the South Carolina DNR. So sort of ultimately these data will end up on the USGS Non-Indigenous Aquatic Species website. And this allows us to track so the spatial and temporal spread of this species. So in North Carolina, again, we've only got three records of it, but if it is established, we expect to see more. And while I've been alluding to the importance of community involvement in tracking where and when blue land crabs are in North Carolina and beyond, right? There's so much more to it. Community science in sort of a scenario like this can have a huge amount of power. So we're at the very leading edge of what appears to be establishment of a large charismatic non-native species in the state. Okay, 100%. Knowing where these crabs are and if and how they're spreading is absolutely essential to sort of understanding what are we going to be dealing with moving forward in the future? But what are they doing? What effects might they be having? How might this change over time? I mean, we're in a unique, yes, I'm using this again and actually appropriately, unlike in my PSA where I just butchered the use of the word. Apologies to everybody there. But we are in a unique situation here where many of these questions can be addressed through community science with your help your observations, and essentially your willingness to, you know, work with us as partners to really understand this crab, this this new to North Carolina species, and not in a new species description sort of way. Okay, I'm going to shift gears a little bit here. So the use of community involvement tracking non-Indigenous species in the southeastern U.S. is not unprecedented. And I could go on and on and on about, you know, invasive crayfish species and sort of other things, but I'm just I'm going to keep focusing on on some taxa that are really not necessarily kind of in my direct wheelhouse beyond as a collections person. OK, so this is the tiger shrimp, Canaeus monodon which is native to areas of the Indo-Pacific. But it's been broadly used in aquaculture. And when you see how large these shrimp can get, you'll understand there's their draw. So I have here, and this also comes from the Surtsey collection. I'm actually gonna try to set this on my shoulder so you can see. So this is a single individual of a tiger shrimp that was collected off the coast of South Carolina, I believe, and I wanna flip this upside down. They're huge. So they are good eating. So of course there was sort of this, this huge push to actually sort of to, to spread this worldwide in these aquaculture systems, um, primarily for, for food. Okay, in 1988, some unknown number of tiger shrimp were accidentally released from a culture pond in South Carolina, coastal South Carolina. That's the political way of saying gobs and gobs and gobs of shrimp got out into the ocean. Okay, over the, no the course of the next couple of months, almost 300 individual tiger shrimp were caught in trawl nets off the coast of South Carolina, Georgia, and Northeastern Florida. Then nothing. They disappeared. And for 18 years, not a single tiger shrimp was collected in this area. So I think everybody either forgot about it or huge, you know, sort of like sighed a huge, well, had a huge sigh of relief, I guess is the way to put it. But of of course, everything is clearly too good to be true. 18 years, that magical number. Okay, in September 2006, a single adult male tiger shrimp was captured near Dauphin Island in Alabama. And about a month later, 
a handful of specimens were found in Pamlico Sound, North Carolina. So you can see the timeline here on the right that shows the spread throughout the Gulf region. So when these sort of, when the tiger shrimp was first picked up in, in these different areas. So in 2006, following the appearance of the tiger shrimp in Alabama and North, in, in North Carolina, there was sort of a big regional agency push for community involvement, in this case, really targeting a lot of the, you know, so the fisheries folks, you know, the folks that were out with the trawlers and the shrimp boats and such to, to really to record sightings of the tiger shrimp. I'm going to zoom in on this map a little bit more closely. There's something important that I want you to see here. Now they picked up from, you know, from about 2006 to about 2012, kind of this, this Big community push really picked up a number of reports of the tiger shrimp up and down the East Coast. And in fact, there are several sightings kind of throughout or in coastal North Carolina. But interestingly, with all of this reporting, we only have one voucher of a tiger shrimp from North Carolina in the collection, just one. Okay, why are collections important? Okay, that physical voucher. So why is it sort of concerning, a little bit concerning to me, I guess, that as we've been kind of, you know, reporting or sort of pulling in reports of, of tiger shrimp up and down um, the East Coast, that we don't actually have physical vouchers. Well, that physical voucher is something that's tangible and can be revisited should our understanding of species diversity change, right? So a photograph is just that. If you have questions about it, something looks a little off down the road, you know, you can't actually, you know, handle it and look at the nitty gritty morphology. You can't extract DNA from it or tissues for chemical analysis. So you think about museum collections or specimens in museum collections as being irreplaceable snapshots in time and place. But it's also more than just the specimen in itself, right? So what might that sp specimen have on it or associated with it? Diseases, parasites, other kind of hitchhikers, entities that we might not even know how to, you know, not know to look for or even how to look for at the time of collection that might be invaluable in the future as we see sort of the spread of various other things, right? So I'm going to come full circle here, kind of wrap it up with another example of why collections are so very important with respect to the blue land crab. Okay, so I told you that that first blue land crab that was reported to the South Carolina DNR in Charleston in 1997. And then basically over the course of Nearly 25 years, they had maybe a dozen reports of other blue land crabs. Well, that's certainly kind of, you know, trying to trying to suss out how and when blue land crabs, you know, made it into South Carolina and how they might have spread. That sets the stage for a particular story. Well, shortly after all of this really picked up steam, which basically was just only a few weeks ago, really, when, when it comes down to it, I actually walked back into the collection here, the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences, and I was looking through, you know, all of the um, land crab specimens that we have. And I came across a jar that was just labeled as G. carcinidae, so just down to family. And it's from Charleston, you know, Charleston County, South Carolina, Mount Pleasant, so just north of Charleston. And indeed, you look at the specimen, and it's a blue land crab, but it was collected in 1979. So now that changes kind of this whole thinking of, okay, 1997 was that kind of that initial appearance. It appears that that blue land crab is, you know, is, has been, or at least was introduced into South Carolina. Perhaps it it was not an introduction that that took, you know, maybe again, that was that solo kind of hitchhiking crab that 
made it, lived its life happily in Mount Pleasant, and then passed away. But still, the fact that this had been sitting here in the collection and had actually come to us by way of the Charleston Museum, it's pretty fascinating. Definitely puts a new spin on kind of this history of the spread of the blue land crab. And with that, I'll say thank you, and I'll stop my uh, screen share. Excellent stuff. Bronwyn, thank you for sharing these stories with us today. I am fascinated. Uh, well, let me do this. Everybody, drop your thanks and appreciations to Dr. Williams in the chat for sharing. Thank you very much. Uh, and then also, viewers, if you've got questions, thoughts, concerns, if you've seen a blue land crab, get in the chat and let us know about it. Um, and, of course, other questions as well. We've got several minutes here where we can take your questions. Um, Bronwyn, I'm curious if you can inform me a little bit about crab natural history or crab biology or uh, crab life history or maybe even blue land crab life history such that one like a, a that they could disperse into North Carolina or that they could survive here if they're a land crab how do they move through the water how does that happen that one survives on a boat that comes up from Myrtle Beach uh, I'm a little unclear on how that might happen or how they're adapted to be able to withstand that Sure. So, I mean, what's amazing about this this group of land crabs is their adaptation to a terrestrial lifestyle. And, and part of that involves, you know, sort of morphological adaptations that allow them to survive certain amounts of desiccation. So I think that that, you know, blue land crabs can survive out of, you know, humid. I mean, humidity plays a role in this, um, but they can basically be well away from from water for I don't know. I think I've seen, you know, reports of 24 hours, 24, 36 hours. Um, so, I mean, I, I would, I would say that, let's say if, you know, somebody's got their, their boat on a trailer and they're, they're kind of, they're hauling it up from the Myrtle beach area, you know, four or five hour drive is going to, it's not going to be a problem for, you know, crab to be sort of hanging onto the frame or, you know, in somebody's luggage or something like that. Um, the, the Makes light. Sense, yeah. Yeah, so the, the the life life cycle of of these crabs is fascinating, um, and I'm I may not be hundred percent clear on on how this works, but the adult stages are terrestrial, and they are burrowers. So they're they're basically going to dig burrows, probably down to the water table, um, you know, away from the beaches and such. So they're going to be you know, not necessarily where you expect to see fiddler crabs. They don't seem to overlap much. But, you know, in people's yards or, again, in these, you know, maritime forest areas or even like lowlands alongside um, canals or ditches. Now, the larval stages actually do require marine, like a saltwater influence. So when the female lays her eggs and, you know, like... Sort of many other decapod crustaceans, she's going to lay her eggs kind of and deposit them on the external, you know, part of her body under her tail, her abdomen, right? She's going to carry those around for a period of time. Once they've actually developed to a certain, certain embryonic stage, she actually needs to find uh, water of, you know, at a certain amount of sort of salt concentration. And then she shakes her babies loose. So, you know, those eggs won't hatch and those larval forms um, sort of won't develop unless they're in salt water. So she kind of has to go migrate to the ocean, as it were, release her, her you know, her young, who in, which in theory may actually get picked up by currents and moved around as well. Now, given the currents in this area... This is where I wish I had Megan sitting behind my my shoulder to sort of slap me if I say something incorrect. Given the currents in this area, I think what we'd expect for the most part is for those to actually swoop down southward if they're going to be picked up by currents at all. It could be wrong. So I don't think we expect sort of northward expansion per se. 
these crabs are, they're pretty agile. So I think there's a, there's a certain amount of ground that they'll be able to cover by themselves. Um, and then with a, with a, you know, kind of a helping hand. So I guess that, that area that I'm really interested in is, you know, in between Myrtle Beach and Emerald Isle, you know, are there any blue crabs there that have just gone unnoticed? And I, you know, I, I think that because blue land crabs, well, I think they're they're startling for many people when you see them, the adult forms. They're they're big. They're really big. Um, they're not always bright blue. But maybe juveniles pass off as, you know, fiddler crabs or ghost, you know, ghost crabs that people just see out of place and don't think much of it. Um so hopefully I answered your question and in, in all of that. Uh yeah, well, and you and you even answered sort of what I was wondering is, you know, is there some sort of slow northward migration that these crabs are uh, experiencing or is it this hopscotch effect where, you know, yeah, one one tags along on, on a boat or some luggage or, uh, you know, some kids beach trip to Myrtle turns into a bucket full of crabs that wind up back in Emerald Isle, I don't know, uh, and gets dumped out in their backyard and then all of a sudden they show up just dotting the landscape versus something that I think maybe I think about when I think um, of non-native species that spread, right? Like they appear and then they establish and then they grow. And then you start to see that range map shifting, whether or not it's related to human engagement directly or not. Like, uh, I don't know, I think of like coyotes, right? Range expanding through throughout the southeast if blue land crabs are just thinking you know, well you know what north carolina sounds like a great place to live let's go check it out and just moving northward but uh let me grab some questions from the chat for you because we had some good ones roll in uh, kim wants to know if you were able to capture the one that was in the pot at the at the uh barbecue which I guess exactly. you've got no North Carolina specimens at this point. No, none. We are still looking for for vouchers at this point. Yeah. No, and then, yeah. so yeah, if one shows up at your party in a bucket of water, let us know about it. <laughs> um, and then we've had several people who want to know if they can eat blue land crabs. Yes, you can. Uh, apparently, they are commonly eaten in um, sort of coastal South America and the Caribbean. Now, I am not sure how and 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 what, um, but but yes, apparently they they make some good eating. Good to know. Uh, at least you know, folks in the chat are sort of like, so if we find one, should we eat it and then tell you? <laughs> or should we tell you and they need it? No, they're not safe. Oh, but okay. Let's see. Here's a real one. What environmental impact could they have? Is it something that we should be thinking about eradicating? Uh, or is it just sort of a wait and see monitor? So that's a very good question. And and I, I guess the answer is we don't exactly know. Um, so in terms of, of density and distribution, we're definitely several steps behind South Carolina. And what South Carolina is seeing is that there, there may be some, you know, some impacts to, um, let's say, coastal agricultural fields or, uh, let's say, people's yards. So blue land crabs are vegetarians. Um, they're, they're not going to be basically picking off, you know, native rodents or other crabs and vertebrates and things like that. They're basically going to be going for all the tender shoots and yummy plants. And I think as I, I had sort of dropped earlier in the talk, uh, I learned from the South Carolina DNR folks that they love blueberries. So if you have one, if you have a burrow in your, in your backyard and want to see one, just, you know, drop some blueberries around the edge of that burrow and apparently you're good. Um, so I, I, I guess, you know, I think from, from a nuisance species aspect, you've got the potential for, you know, people's gardens disappearing or looking a little different. Um, potentially, as I said, kind of, you know, um, farm fields that have young shoots at certain times a year, that that might be problematic if we have higher densities. Other than that, um, you know, we, really, I think at this point, you just kind of consider it, it, it's probably 
established already to the point where eradication is going to be tough, not necessarily impossible. Um, but until we actually know how it got here, we won't be able to stop it getting back here. I guess that's the other, you know, with it's kind of, you know, whack-a-mole um, in a sense. So now there is there is some concern because the, you know, blue land crabs have have increased in 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 numbers in and around urban areas of Charleston, that their burrows that are along sidewalks or alongside buildings might have some structural influence. I guess that is to be seen uh, and and to be watched out for. Um, again, I think all of this is supposition as to to what you know what effect they may have. But again, I think that's why you know we really want to get the word out to have you know not just this hey, when you see it first time, let us know, but maybe try to establish these, you know, these connections that have some degree of longevity, or not even some degree, have some longevity with folks in the community that are seeing these crabs. So we might be able to establish things like, you know, camera trap setups, or ways that we can monitor what their impacts are, what are these crabs doing? How are they moving? Um, I think we're in a really, really neat situation to be able to kind of work with the community to actually establish what the science is that, you know, and the information that we want to glean from this situation. One stuff. Uh, one of our viewers wants to know how they found out about the blueberries. I do not know if... If Aaron Weeks is is or Mike Kendrick or any of the folks from South Carolina are are watching this, please drop the answer in the chat. Well, well yeah, we'll see if they see if they show up and tell yeah. us why how they found out that blue land crabs like blueberries. That's a there's got to be a fun story there. There's got to be one. I know. All right, uh, Will wants to know if people should submit specimens if they come across them. Yes, please, if possible. So um, if you are brave enough to try to catch one of these things, let's say put it in a bucket or what have you, um, you know, certainly if, you know, I'm happy to take them live. Um, if it's if if it's something that you do not want to deal with on your own, um, just contact me. Say you've got it in a five gallon bucket or something or other. It'll be fine for a day or two. You know, we can figure out a way to get it back to Raleigh. If it's going to be longer, um, you know, it is possible so that, you know, the the donor with the, you know, Fiddler Crab on steroids, he actually just stuck it in a freezer. So, you know, that is that is another option. If you are able to catch one of these, um, yes, we would love to have it, you know, in the collection again for a multitude of reasons. Um, if you're willing to kind of get it, usher it into a bag or a container that you can then stick in a freezer, that's great. And then contact us, you know, or forget about it for 10 years and then find it and go, oh, that's right. We wanted to, you know, <laughs> we want to get this to the museum. <laughs> well, I, you know, if a blue land crab can sit in a museum collection since 1979 and everybody forgot about it, it can, it can it'll probably hang out in a freezer okay too. All right. It looks like uh, the last one that we've got time for, we're going to go all the way back to the beginning. Is a blue crab the same as a blue land crab? Yeah, uh, it is not. No, nope, okay, completely good. different. So blue crabs are swimming crabs. Um, and actually the, um, you know, the last image, the I got your crabs, you know, image that I that I had in my talk is of a blue is a, is of a blue crab. So completely different habitats, completely different sort of groups of crabs, com completely different lifestyles. Uh, you shouldn't shouldn't be able to mix the two up if you see them side by side or even not side by side. Just yeah, it doesn't sound like you you would encounter them side by side to begin with. No. You yeah. see a big crab crawling around on the ground that's blue. It's you've got a blue land crab. Yeah, and they look like softballs. I mean that the body is is spherical or sort of this this I mean a giant potato, kind of spherical potato with legs. Um and as I said, they can get they they can get very large. Well, Bronwyn, this has been fascinating. What a great story. Thank you for bringing it and sharing it here. Thank you, Chris. Thanks for, thanks for having me on to talk about this.
Yeah, the people in the chat are loving these stories, too. Uh, I think we've at least got a handful of people watching today who, uh, well, at least one person who said they spend a lot of time down on Emerald Isle. So now they know to look for blue land crabs every time they go to visit. So that's great. Uh, and we certainly did a good job of getting the word out about them today. So appreciate yeah, it. and look for, I mean, definitely look for, I know that the uh, Department of, you know, of DMF is actually going to push a press release pretty soon just to get the word out there. Um, we, ex we expect kind of the, you know, the sightings to dip in the winter when it's cold, they'll probably be hunkered down in their burrows. But we're going to try to push the word out again in the spring to get people kind of interested in looking in the summer. So spread the word, keep the interest up and, you know, thank you in advance. Excellent stuff. We'll have to have you back to talk more about tiger shrimp. Uh, we'll have to get that whole story one day in the future, too, I think. Absolutely. Thanks, Chris. About that one. All right, everybody. Thanks for tuning in to this edition of the Lunchtime Discovery Series. We'll be back here again next Wednesday at noon. You can subscribe to the museum's YouTube channel to get the notification when we go live with great programs and events that you could participate in, just like this one. You can also sign up for the Lunchtime Discovery Series newsletter at the Office of Environmental Education's website. Just take a scroll up through the chat. They've been sharing links to all of their resources, as well as links to some of the resources that Bronwyn talked about uh, and shared today. Things like where to report blue land crabs and also the Ask a Naturalist form out of the museum's Naturalist Center, where you can submit observations of just about anything in the natural world if you want to get it identified We'll do our very best with the experts we have here at the museum. We will be back here next week for the lunchtime series. We're talking geology in North Carolina, so don't miss out. It's going to rock. Have a great week, everybody. We'll see you again soon. Bye, folks. <laughs>